Okay, now let's move on to the statistical inference portion of the exam. 41A asks, true or false, a 95% confidence interval is wider than a 90% confidence interval. And that's true, because in general, the greater our confidence level is, um, the wider our confidence interval will be. Okay, so for example, a 99% confidence interval is wider than a 95, which is wider than a 90, and so on and so forth. Okay? B, a p-value of 0.97 says that under the null model, there is a 97% chance of observing a test statistic at least as extreme as the one calculated from the data. And that's also true. The reason for that is because the definition of a p-value is the probability of observing something as or more extreme as your observation, given that the null hypothesis is true. And that's exactly what this is saying. We're saying that um, the, the p-value of 0.97 means that there's a 97% chance of observing something as or more extreme as our observation under the assumption that the null model is true. So that's true. Okay. C, suppose we have 100 samples drawn independently from a population. If we construct separate, uh, a separate 95% confidence interval for each sample, 95 of them will include the population mean. Okay, so this one's a little tricky. We would expect 95 of them to contain the population mean, but we don't know for sure. And this, the, the way that this is worded, it's almost implying that for sure 95% will contain the population mean. And there's no guarantee of that. So it's false. On average, it should be 95, but we don't know what it actually will be. Okay. 42, a roulette wheel has 12 green, or sorry, two green slots, 18 red slots, and eight black slots. Suppose you observe 760 games and you see that the red is chosen 380 times. A, what's the expected number of times that the red slot is chosen? Well, first we want to find the probability that on any one spin, it's the red slot. Well, so there's 18 red outcomes over 18 plus 18 plus 2, which is 38. So on any one spin, we'd expect it to be red 18 out of 38 times, okay? And now if we assume each of the spins are independent, we can just multiply this quantity by 760, which gives us 18 over 38 times 760, which is the second option. Okay, B, now we're hypothesizing that the wheel lands red more frequently than 8 out of 38 of the time. Um, what should our null hypothesis be if we want to try and test to see um, if the probability of landing red is more than 18 out of 38? Well, by default, our null is what we are already assuming to be true and what we are trying to disprove. And, right, and so by default, what we're going to assume to be true is that um, it appears red in proportion to the number of red slots, which is 18 out of 38. So our null hypothesis is that the probability of landing red is 18 out of 38, because that's what we're trying to disprove, and that's sort of what we're already assuming to be true. Okay, C, you study this problem by running a simulation of 10,000 replications, and the percentiles for the proportion of red are shown below. Using the common 5% convention for statistical significance, is the null model consistent with your observations? Okay, so first of all, we should probably calculate the proportion for our observed. Okay, i.e. we should calculate the test statistic for our observation. And we're told that we observe 760 games and 380 of them were red. Okay, so our proportion, proportion observed is 380 out of 760, which is actually one half. Now we need to find the p-value of the test statistic one half, right? And it turns out um, the p-value, uh, or sorry, um, the 95th percentile of proportions was 0 0.504. And since our observed is slightly less than that, our observed is you know probably somewhere between 90 and 95% in terms of percentile, um, our observed proportion is not in the 5% of most extreme test statistics um, under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis because the um, probability of observing the test statistic of one half is um, more than 5% under the assumption that the null is true. Okay, so is the null model consistent with our observations? Here we'd say yes. We don't have enough evidence to reject the null. Okay, so that's true. 
43, two methods of memorizing words are to be compared, and we're trying to find um, a null hypothesis for this experiment and trying to figure out different ways to test this experiment. So, um, first of all, the null hypothesis for this experiment is that there is no difference in the average numbers of words recalled blank, okay? And so, this whole idea of um, pairing people off and, you know, making sure they're in the same age group and same education level is more of a semantic with regards to how we're testing our hypothesis, right? The actual hypothesis we're testing is the fact that there's no difference in average words recalled across mem memorization methods, okay? This pair ID, education level, age group stuff is just, um, that only has to do with how we're actually running the experiment, okay? The hypothesis itself is that these two memorization methods are roughly the same. Okay, so that's why that's the first option. Now in B, which of the following describes a reasonable test statistic for this um, experiment? Okay, so what we would guess is for each pair of people, we would subtract the words um, recalled by one person by the other, and we'd expect on average that um, if the difference in um, memorization methods is insignificant, we'd expect on average that the difference should be zero. But anyways, um, what we'd expect is that we should do the first option, okay? Group by pair ID, um, and then subtract the number of words recalled from the person doing one, um, or memorization method one, and the number of words recalled by person who's doing memorization method two, okay? And then we take the average of these, distance, uh, these differences, and that'll sort of be our test statistic, okay? Um, the second option is not correct because um, we're not trying to find anything particular regarding age group and education, right? What we're trying to do is, given that someone's age or two people's age group and education are the same, what's the difference in their number of words recalled um, in these two different memorization methods? Which is why we're grouping by pair ID because we've already implicitly sorted people by age group and education. So that's why it's the first option, okay? And C, instead you decide to use the permutation test to analyze your data, which, what permutation is justified by the design of the experiment. So first of all, the question is what should we group by? So within what category should we shuffle things? And again, that's within pair ID. Okay, and essentially what we're going to do is within pair ID, instead of assigning, you know, person A to method one and person B to method two, we will shuffle that. So maybe we'll assign person A to method two and person B to method one. So what we're going to shuffle or permute are the values of the memorization method. Cool, and again, I apologize if that explanation wasn't super clear, but um, the textbook is a great resource for learning more about permutation tests. Okay, so that wraps up the statistical inference portion of the exam.